Hello, everybody online. Welcome. <laughs> so um, this morning we have someone really special here, Prof. John Wasserman, and we have the highest regard for him. And um, we welcome you and we thank you so much for coming. And um, so this morning we're <clears throat> sorry. This morning we're not going to have um, live, you know, like worship before the time. So this is going to be a little bit different. The this, this session. So we. We already had some worship last night, so, um, but uh, Prophet John is going to, to teach us concerning prayer, and I'm really looking forward to it, so, so uh, well done you for coming. I, <laughs> I think this is going to be one of the most important sessions you ever had in your life, um, to, to be deepened in prayer. All right, so I'm going to hand over to Prophet John, he's going to do the offering for us as well. So thank you so much for coming, Prophet. We, we receive you as a prophet, as a man of God. We thank you for, for your ministry and for your life. We really love you. Say, so, amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, congratulations. Well done to you. Because normally at conferences, when you're going to do uh, teaching on prayer, it's the least attended. I'm looking forward to the day when the prayer meetings are the best attended. Is that okay? Thanks. And um, so this morning is going to be a little bit interactive. Um, I'm going to get you to pray. <clears throat> and, um, and if you're not praying hard enough, we will have disciplinary measures. <laughs> no, not, not, I'm just teasing. Sorry, I'm, I was a little bit late. I underestimated my time getting here. Um, I don't like to disrespect your time, and, and so I apologize for that. But it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Pastor Gerrit and Lene, for the invitation to be here and to teach on prayer. So this is one of the most important uh, subjects that we can, we can undertake because as Christians, we ought to be praying. In fact, um, Jesus never suggested it. He commanded it. Um, when uh, he said, for example, when you pray, he didn't say if you pray. And, and so it's something that we need to uh, get a hold of um, because like so many other spiritual disciplines, um, <clears throat> often we as pastors, we are guilty. We assume people know um, and we tell them they need to pray, um, but we don't take time out to pray. So I'm hugely appreciative to Pastor Gerrit and Lene for, for undertaking a conference entitled Teach Us to Pray. And um, so, so it's really, really, really good. Now there's no ways, there's no ways I'm going to get through everything that there is to say on prayer in these two sessions. Uh, there's just no ways. You, you, you know, I've started a, um, <clears throat> a prayer teaching manual and there's just reams and reams of notes, pages and pages of notes, um, because there's different kinds of prayers um, that we can pray, different occasions, different challenges, different needs, and things like this. But I want to just touch on something, some things today um, in prayer. Is that okay? If we do that, that, that's brilliant. So before we start, so Pastor Herod, am I right that you, you want everyone to give their millions now? Yes. Okay, so right at the start, I, I think it'll be good to, to have a look at it. Um, and so the Apostle Paul talks about it in Galatians 6. Thank you, everybody that's doing all the technical stuff. Really appreciate you guys. Um, so in Galatians chapter 6, he talks about, you know, those who receive instruction in the Word. Let's just leave that part out. But it's really interesting that in Galatians 6, he picks up from, uh, from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. And, uh, um, but we know also in Galatians 5.22, he talks about, but the fruit of the Spirit. You remember that? It's, it's interesting in Galatians 5.25 when he talks about the fact that he said, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Are you all good? Okay, nod if you remember that verse. Once, long time ago when you read it. 
Okay. All right. So, so he, he says, since we live by the Spirit, <clears throat> in other words, we owe our, our Christian existence, we owe our lives to the Spirit. He was the one that came into our hearts when we prayed a simple little prayer and cried out to Jesus, and uh, he caused us to become born again. Amen. And um, he recreated our spirit. So since we live by the Spirit, he says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And then that lifestyle will cause fruit to come. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And I like the fact that um, every one of those descriptions after that, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, are all attributes and outcomes of the one word, love. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. I like what one great uh, teacher said, one of the divines, you know. He said, uh, <clears throat> because the next one is joy, he says, joy is love with its dancing shoes on. And then peace is love at rest. And so all of those are, so all of those are love. So now, so in between, he, uh, the Apostle Paul starts to pick up on the, on the whole thing of giving, and then he re makes reference back to what he covered in chapter 5 in that we can walk by the flesh or we can live by the Spirit. It's interesting that he talks about the, the things that come out of the flesh as the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. So it's almost like in Paul's mind, you've got to really work hard at sinning. But it should be that everything else it's just fruit. Now, it's really interesting that that word fruit of the Spirit, capital S, can also be fruit of the Spirit in some translations, little s. In other words, the fruit of your Spirit indwelt by the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, all of those things. So then he, he comes back to giving. It's very interesting that, to me, that Paul would select this whole thing of giving, um, and, and talk about, and, and uh, in, in this particular case, and isolate that as um, an example of where we can hear from the flesh or we can hear from the Spirit. It's really interesting. It's amazing to me that, um, <clears throat> that the, the wallet, the checkbook, is the last thing to get saved. When a person comes to Jesus, it's the last thing to get born again. I mean, <clears throat> that thing just, just refuses to give up, give up, you know, and surrender to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but they say that every cell in our body dies. Our skin layer on our arms and, and things like this, the outer skin layer, is as a result of cells dying and then they go outward. You know, you're always shedding skin and things like this, our hair follicles and everything like that. It's really interesting. Every cell in our body is subject to death except fat cells. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. It's like fat cells have accepted Jesus because they almost have eternal life. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to get rid of. <laughs> but but, but the, the, there is such an attachment to the flesh to finances for so many reasons. And um, um, it's something that the Lord is, is challenging me and constantly challenging me on is because Paul says it in Galatians 6, if we sow to the flesh and we know what that brings, he says it brings corruption or destruction. And, uh, <clears throat> and if we slow, uh, sow to the Spirit, we reap eternal life. Amen? But just recently, the Lord has been speaking to me about, um, he said, when last, this is what he said to me, when last did you make a significant financial contribution, investment into the kingdom. I'm not talking about our regular tithes. That's a given. Is that okay? It's a given. That's something it's required, and that's something um, that we should just bring to the Lord, bring ye, you know, the whole tithe to the Lord. And so, so that is just something we bring. He's earmarked that. That's his. So you don't give a tithe. You bring a tithe. Are you all good? All you're doing is giving back to him what he's saying, that's mine. <laughs> that portion in my salary. And it's amazing to me how so many Christians, they think because they're tithing, they're doing God a favor. Not in this church. Not in this church. 
not in Martin's church, these other churches where they think God's doing a favor. But this morning, let's, let's sow to the Spirit. Um, one of the, the, the things to me always is it's quite interesting that we, we take the offering at the beginning of the service. And, but I think that's such a good spiritual thing because you're, you're making an investment into the realm of the Spirit. You're making investment into the Spirit you're making an investment into your own spiritual life even before you heard the word. And that's always, A, it's an act of faith, and B, that's a way of honoring the word before you even get it. And that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 um, that from the spirit we reap, from the spirit we reap. Is that okay? So this morning what I want you to do is not let your wallet, your bank balance, your bank account, your smartphone, whatever it is that you're going to use, I don't want that to speak to you. I want the Lord to speak to you and make an investment into the kingdom this morning. Is that okay? Be all good? If, you, if you've forgotten how to type million, it's M-I-L-L-I-O-N. Okay. <clears throat> Ten is T-E-N. Hallelujah. All right. Can I share a testimony with you quick? Okay, just one testimony before you give. Are you ready? So, so one day I stood up in church, and I, I promise you I was, I was broker than the church mouse. And the church mouse <clears throat> used to feed in our kitchen at the church. It was a fat little thing, and I battled to catch him. But he lived better than I lived. But the one day I stood up in church, and, and the Lord dared me to say it. And I said, one day, one day, I will sow one million rand. And there were two business people sitting in the service at the same time, independent of each other, didn't speak to each other. And the one businessman was going through an exceptionally hard time in his business. And he said to the Lord, Lord you spare me, you bless my business, I will make sure Pastor John will be able to sow a million rand. And, and you know what? <clears throat> Just recently, he gave me more than one million rand. Sowed it into my life. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and so we need to have a vision for our giving. Isn't that okay? And, and so... I will still come to the stage. Another business lady was sitting in exactly the same meeting many years ago. She said, you know, she contacted me just recently. She said, she said remember that day in the, in the meeting when you said, da, da, da. And I said, yes, I remember. <clears throat> she, said, um, she said that I'm looking to sell my business this year, and I will make sure that you're able to sell one million rand. Now, it, that doesn't happen because I'm a pastor. So lots of poor pastors. That happens because I've understood the principle of making an investment. Are you with me? So this morning, before you rush to just to go and give 20 bucks, let's decide and just say, what investment do I want to make into the kingdom? Because if from the Spirit I reap, then let's make an investment. So Father, we just want to thank you for this morning as we're about to begin. And uh, Father, there People sitting here, there's people watching online that need to make an investment so there can be a withdrawal. And Father, I thank you that as by your spirit you speak to us, we'll be obedient to your promptings in Jesus' name. Everybody excitedly said, Amen. 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 So come on, let's give. So the details are on screen for those of you who are watching this. It doesn't matter if you're watching it after the fact. You can still use those bank details there and you can sew. The QR code is up everywhere. You can scan the QR code. And those of you who want to give cash, you're welcome to come up and uh, give cash as well. Let's make an investment this morning. <clears throat>
Amen. Let's just reach our hands uh, symbolically towards the baskets. I know that you have also given online and via smartphone. Father, we just want to thank you for the seed sown. And Lord, this morning is with hands extended. We all agree, agree together and we declare the seed blessed. And Father, we are confident, according to your word and your faithfulness to it, that we will reap a good harvest from the seed sown. We're going to reap from the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, so what we're going to do is uh, get struck straight in. And uh, I, I've got I probably too much for the two sessions, but we're going to do our best. Is that okay? So if it's a little bit overwhelming, I'm going to go quick, take as many notes as possible. If not, uh, you can get the, the recording and you can go through it again. I did... Um, Put the notes, the outline notes um, for, for Pastor Herod. I think I put it on the memory stick, but if not, I will um, email it again. I made a mistake. Um, I didn't convert it to a Word document this morning, but then you've got some outline. So my brief from Pastor Herod and Lene was um, also to include some practical sessions in this so that it's not just theory. So as far as possible, um, we're going to do that. One of the foundation blocks that we discover in uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 42 in the early church was that uh, when the first disciples got saved, about 3,000 of them, I want you to na take note of the words, I think they should come up on the screen, Acts 2 42, but take note of the words, it says they, now you have to ask the question who they are, they are the 3,000 that got saved. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So that's the first thing that the new disciples devoted themselves to. Is that correct? They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching. Uh, is, it, is it Acts 2.42 or is it another verse? And they devote, Yeah, there it is. Um, and they noticed, and they steadfastly, that's fine, and they steadfastly devote, persevered, okay, devoting themselves constantly to the instruction and fellowship of the apostles. I'm going to quote it in the NIV. So they devoted themselves, King James says, the apostles' doctrine. They devoted themselves to, to the apostles' teaching. Now, how many of you know we need to devote ourselves to teaching? It's one of the reasons why we come to church. In other words, they were devoted to church. So everyone say church. So church is number one. And it says, um, and to uh, fellowship, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So that's teaching, fellowship, and the fellowship is not only in church, it's the coffee in between, it's not only that, it's visiting each other, it's not only that, it's your um, home cells, life groups, whatever you call them. But the last foundation block of the church upon which the apostolic church was built was the foundation stone of prayer. Are you all good? Now you're going to see that as I start going through the teaching, um, of, of how, how fundamental that was to the early church. Charles Spurgeon says, a prayerful church is a powerful church. And, and so we need to understand that. So um, I've, I've put a few things in here. Don't take me too seriously. Sometimes I'm saying things in a joke, and I mean it. Uh, <laughs> if we pray more for one another... We'll be less judgmental, less critical. We'll gossip less. Amen. Because we've invested time into praying for one another. And hopefully in that time we're praying for one another, we've picked up God's heart and God's attitude and, and, and uh, his thoughts for one another. And, um, and, and so it's part of the reason, it's part of what makes the praying church a powerful church because you don't have time or you don't have the inclination to 
to gossip, to slander, to criticize someone that you've spent hours praying for. Amen? And uh, uh, so therefore, prayer becomes a very high expression of love for one another. I caught myself one day. Well, actually, the Lord caught me. Someone phoned, and I was on the road, and they were just outlying this, you know, this disastrous situation that they were in. And I said, well, all I can do is, uh, all I can do is pray. Um, and immediately the Holy Spirit said to me, it's not all you can do. It's the most you can do. And I went like, oh, my goodness. I phoned the person back, and I said, listen, I'm sorry. Forgive me. The most I can do for you is pray for you. You know, sometimes we, even in our terminology, we diminish the value of prayer. Um, uh, and sometimes, for example, when uh, you go to someone and you, you're unpacking your heart and you're unburdening your heart and, and they say, I'll pray for you, and then you're disappointed. You were hoping maybe that they would just give you some money. <laughs> that would really help right now. But how many of you know that's the most a person can do? Come on, tell the person next to you, Pastor John is speaking to you now, you have to listen. So, <clears throat> so we, 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 mustn't, we mustn't undervalue the power of prayer. We mustn't diminish the power of prayer. You're sitting here today because somebody prayed for you. You are where you are with the Lord because somebody prayed for you here. Is that good? All right. So um, some of the things that I, I, I want to share for you share with you, and, and some of the practical things, goodness, look at the time, some of the practical things is I learned in prayer. Um, I often say to people, and they say, I don't know how to pray, I'll say, start praying, because, you know, you can learn to play tennis in the theory in the classroom, but sooner or later, you've got to get out there on the court and start hitting the ball, and some of, one of the best ways to learn how to pray is to get into prayer. So most of what I've learned, it was not from reading books, but was from prayer. In the early days when I started in the ministry, um, I took over a church that had no people and therefore no money and therefore I had no salary and therefore the church mouse. <clears throat> and, and so there was no one to visit, no one to go and see. I, would, I, I, personally, I personally walked every street in Benera Park 1, uh, 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 proper Benera Park extension 1, 2, and 3, and uh, some of Atlasville and some of Impala Park, I personally street walked and prayed and laid hands on the gates of every single house in that community, praying it. Me personally. Uh, I, was, I was invested in prayer. I figured, well, there's no people to visit. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> you know let, let me just, let me not waste my time. Let me fill my time with prayer. And so, I read a couple of books by the old divines, you know, how they used to pray. They used to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because one of them, I think it was Wesley, said he felt guilty laying in bed in the morning and hearing the feet of the people walking past his window on the way to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. So he figured, as a man of God, I should be praying before they're up. So he started getting up at 3 o'clock. So I started getting up and, and praying at 3 o'clock. The only thing is, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was so tired. So I went back, and then I picked up the book, and I, I read, but they went to bed at 7 o'clock at night. So, you know, I was getting to bed at 10, 11 at night. So I had to change my, my lifestyle quite a bit to be able to pray. But there was a period of time when I figured if prayer is my work as a man of God, then I need to put in a week's worth, week of work's worth of prayer. And I was praying 40 hours of a week praying by the clock. I was praying eight hours a day praying. Often I would pray through the night. If there was an issue and I needed an answer from God for myself uh, or for the church, but mostly it was for the church, I would, I would go and lock myself in the church in the evening at around about six o'clock and I would come out six o'clock the next morning and pray through the entire night. I didn't sleep, I prayed. Fasting was a, a habit of mine. You know, Paul said in fastings oft. So, re so remember the time, during the time of the church mouse? There were many times I fasted, not because I wanted to, but because <laughs> I had to, because <laughs> there was no food. So I would fast. I would just say, 
okay, there's nothing, there's no money, so I declare a holy fast unto the Lord. So I, I cannot remember the amount of times, and, and please, and for those on live stream, I'm not bragging, I want to try and inspire you to a life of prayer. And, and, and so I don't know how many 40-day fasts I've did, more than what I can put on my hands. 33 days, 32 days, 30 days, 21 days, 24 days, 15 days, 10 days. And, and um, I invested myself into fasting and prayer. A lot of the reason why things are happening today in my ministry is because from the Spirit, I am reaping. And so prayer is an investment. And there's some things that I'm going to touch on um, concerning that. Um, there's the short term answers and then there's the long term investment you all understanding what I'm saying okay and so what is prayer and, and some of this you already know so I'm going to skip through them I'm going to go fast prayer is communion with God number two prayer is communication with God this is a subtle difference hence prayer is central to the Christian life I already mentioned that prayer is love in action. So let me just start again. Prayer is communion with God. Prayer is communication with God. Hence, prayer is central to the Christian life. Prayer is love in action. Prayer is always within the revelation, or the confines of the revelation of Scripture. Um, it's, it's amazing, I... <clears throat> There was a, a ministry couple, and uh, their, re, their relationship was going through a difficult time, and there was a third party involved, and so, you know, the minister was, the pastor was gravitating towards this other woman, and um, <clears throat> so I went to go and see the wife of this pastor to see if I could somehow break through um, in, in some kind of counseling and bring reconciliation. Um, it was just, you know, the beginning stages of like infatuation and spending too much unnatural time, unhealthy time together, and this kind of thing. While I was with the pastor's wife, the woman involved said to the pastor, why don't we pray quickly because God answers prayer that <clears throat> she falls in love with Pastor John. <laughs> Exactly. Your pastor said that's witchcraft. So prayer is always within the confines of the revelation of Scripture. Is that okay? Prayer is not trying to twist God's arm. Prayer is um, appropriating those things that are His revealed will for us. Okay? Amen? And so um, things that you understand. So in the Bible, just very simply, um, what is prayer? So I'm going to use a fancy English word. I'm going to try and explain it. Prayer is supplication. Supplication in its um, um, simplest form is request. Um, it's, a, it's a petition. It's a plea. It's an entreaty. Those are all different words. But it's presenting a request to God. It's something that you're asking for. But the Bible word uses supplication because it's a little bit stronger than just simply asking, and there is degrees of asking. Um, how many of you know you can just ask for something, but if you're desperate, you would literally beg? I think there's a good Afrikaans word that, that uh, goes out, it's this, a smirk, a smirk, and that is a deep plea, that's, that's a, almost a begging. And you know, there are people who go like, you don't have to beg God. No, you don't have to beg God at all. But there are times because of the intensity of the need, it comes, it, it comes as if you are, you are smirking God. And it's not because he's unwilling. There's other things that we, that we will bring out. So supplication is at the heart of prayer. And it always springs out of a sense of need and a belief that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen? That's Hebrews 11 verse 6. So supplication. So, so just to help you to understand. 
Supplication or entreaty or presenting a request in the Bible is often presented by the word petition. So you will see prayers and petitions. So a petition is a prayer for yourself, for your own family, for your own needs. Just broadly speaking, simply speaking. Are you good? And then uh, the other way of petitioning God is in intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer are those prayers you pray for other people. Is that okay? You will understand that? I just wanted to make sure that you understand. So petitions and intercessions. But prayer has got a much broader meaning than that. Um, prayer is... Actually, so, so when Jesus said, he, he cleaned out the temple and he said, you know, it's written that my, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. It doesn't mean that they would just have prayer meetings there. Because remember after that, Jesus taught and Jesus healed. Um, and we know that worship took place and other things. So prayer then becomes synonymous with every action with, with our souls by which we reach out to God. So prayer then therefore includes adoration, confession, thanksgiving, um, worship, etc., etc., etc. That all becomes part of a life of prayer. It's very interesting that the Hebrew and the Greek words for prayer um, can mean anything from a short, sharp, direct petition or cry from the heart to God out of distress. For example, Psalm 30 verse 2 in the King James, New King James says, Oh Lord my God, I cried out to you and you heard me and you healed me. I cried out to God, cried out to God. In a prayer, and, 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 and a bit later, hopefully if we've got time, we'll get on to it, but prayer um, exceeds even um, what you can utter with your, with your language. It's one of the reasons why he's given us the awesome gift of tongues, to help us to be more articulate, um, even though it transcends our understanding. But, but very often, a prayer is just, a, just an inner groan, an inner cry, an inner longing. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Um, it's funny, I, it, I was just chatting with Philip, but two, three weeks ago, he was so much on my heart. And um, uh, how many of you have experienced that? You have. Okay, good. And, and, and I want you to understand that that is a form of prayer. So I've learned now that whenever I'm thinking of somebody, I fire up a quick prayer just in case. I mean, I could be wrong and I could be right. <clears throat> so I immediately just, just offer up a prayer and I'll just say, Lord, be with Philip, whatever it is. You know, just be with him. You understand what I'm saying? Um, 99 times out of 100, if I phone that person, it's spot on. They go like, yeah, it's just like, well, you know. You know what, that, that to me very often is like, <clears throat> um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's almost like the, uh, almost like a moment of conception of a child in the womb. It's because you're carrying something in, in, in spiritually in your, in your womb, if you understand, in your spiritual womb, you're carrying some, and you're carrying that person, and you, they're in your heart, and you're meditating. That's a form of prayer. Are you all good? And sometimes we need to just get in touch with that and, and, and start to understand that. Why would you be standing washing the dishes or you cleaning the car or something like this and suddenly you think of someone, uh, you're in a moment of maybe meditation or whatever, you know, mindlessness or whatever, you're not in your logical you know, operating mind, you're more in sort of your intuitive artistic side, and then just suddenly you pick something up in the Spirit. We need to learn that those are things that the Holy Spirit drops in us. You know, Paul made a statement when he said, pray without ceasing. And I tried my hardest. I couldn't get that right because I figured I needed eight hours sleep a night. So, you know, you work for a boss, you've got to give him full eight hours concentrated effort in order to earn your money. Is that Okay. But, but the, the concept of praying without ceasing is that I'm always available to pray. Prayer is my, 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 my go-to. Prayer is not an afterthought. Prayer is my whole attitude. And so I'm, I'm really excited for, for this church, uh, for Christ Life Revival Ministries, is because if we're doing teachings and trainings on prayer, we can teach our prayer, uh, church to pray. Then it becomes a house of prayer. And then we have a culture of prayer. Uh, biblical terms, 
then we walk, we have a spirit of prayer. You know, Paul talks about it as a a spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. And um, that's a spirit of faith. In other words, when I open my mouth, faith comes out. You know, it's in my heart, but it's in my conversation. It's the things that I speak. And prayer, a spirit of prayer, is is where prayer is your go-to. You're instant in prayer. You're responsive in prayer. And there's some other things that I'll touch on. Everybody with me so far? Awesome. So, so then prayer is also, um, for example, Hannah's prayer, recorded in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, but I'm going to just read verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. That was actually a song. It was a prophetic song, a song of praise. Um, thanking the Lord for giving her a son, um, um, uh, Eli, uh, Samuel. And so, and so it's a song of praise. But, but it says she prayed when she did that. That's what the word says. So prayer can be that. And then, of course, also it can be intercession mixed with, you know, lofty doxologies. Remember in Ephesians 3.19, Paul prayed, for this reason I kneel before the Father, uh, you know, um, the Father in heaven from whom the whole family derives its name, the family on earth derives its name. I pray that out of, you know. And then he goes on after that, and he goes into this magnificent doxology where he says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think or imagine. So I'm giving you these examples to show prayer is broader than just asking. Okay, great. But we're going to get on to the asking bit. Right. So why must we pray? Because God has commanded us to pray. We're not going to look at all the scriptures. I'm going to just read them. Are you ready? Pray for those who persecute you. We'll start with the hard ones first. And when you pray, Jesus said. So the first one was Matthew 5, 44. Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray. Matthew 6, 9. This is then how you should pray. Uh, Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Woo! That's a good verse. You know why? Because when it's going well, it's going good, and the blessings are flowing, we don't pray as much. Is that right? So I'll mention something on that later. You know, and it's when, when it's dark and it's hard and there's no money. And, People are coming against me, and it's like difficult, and then it's like the light bulb goes on, and we go, oh, let's pray. <laughs> you know, so, so he, Paul says, be faithful in prayer, good times and in hard times, all right? And then he goes on, and he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So there's a multiplicity of prayers that you can pray. There's a multiplicity of ways that you can present your requests. And uh, it, it's good to look at them. So when the, thank you, Pastor Herod, you've launched a, a prayer training manual <laughs> for me. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but, but there's a multiplicity. And I, I've been um, touching on some things just recently in our church. Our theme since the beginning of, uh, end of last year has been until Christ be formed in you. And I've been uh, going through the spiritual disciplines and things like that. But there's a multiplicity of ways of presenting requests. So Paul is talking about the richness of variety of prayer. And he's saying, just get in there and just pray. Amen. But, but the context is, he says, um, where, where, where am I? Uh, it's, it's being joyful and being patient and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Ephesians 6, 18, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So remember that this is not to the pastors. This is to every single saint. Devote yourselves to prayer. Amen? And then let's continue. Pray continually. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. That's praying without ceasing. Even the Labrador wants to pray. You must know that I'm really excellent if they're... 
the animals come to church. Um, so, so pray continu- continually. And then, of course, also in priority in prayer, he says, first of all, requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, and especially those in authority. Amen? I don't know if you've noticed, but I think those in authority really need our prayers. Okay. All right, so just continuing, prayer is an act of obedience because God has called us to pray. Prayer, um, and, and one day I was, um, I was in prayer, and this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me, um, for me, and he said, prayer is your declaration of dependence on me. In the act of praying, you are by your actions declaring your dependence on him. Next, let's have a look at the next one. Um, we personally cannot change without prayer. You know, I read the story of a young man who came to the senior statesman in the Lord, and he said, uh, um, <clears throat> because he, he knew that this man was a man of prayer, and he said to him, he said, uh, Sir, brother, um, could you please teach me how to pray? And so this wizened old Man of God turned to this young man and he said, well, how much do you pray? And he said, "Um, well, nothing at the moment. That's why I've come to see you. So the wise old man looked at the young man. He said, can you tell me when you became so arrogant? And the young man said, no, 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 no. I'm not not, not arrogant. And he said, anyone who doesn't pray is filled with pride. Yowza. <clears throat> if you can't say amen, say a no. All right. So we cannot change without prayer. I don't know if you've noticed, how many of you have noticed is that many times in praying for breakthroughs, praying things to change, the breakthrough has to happen in you first. Everybody say me first, me, me first. And uh, very often when I'm praying, God changes me in the process. God's changing my heart because I'm spending time in communion with him. And uh, uh, because very often a lot of my external things are directly related to my internals, my attitudes or my lack of belief or just whatever. Okay. So we cannot change without prayer. Last point, we cannot make an eternal difference without prayer. I like what um, this particular Bible teacher said. The immediate purpose of prayer is the accomplishing of God's will on earth. Let me just say that again. The immediate purpose of prayer is the accomplishing of God's will on earth. The ultimate purpose of prayer is the eternal glory of God. There's always a bigger picture. You know, we we think prayer is just presenting supplications, um, petitions for ourselves. Prayer is intercession for others. But God has got a much bigger picture in everything. Uh, let me just say this for your, um, for your um, edification, just to encourage you. We, we can try and, and have all the doctrines right. We can try and know the Bible. We can try... Um, as much as we want to, to get everything 100% right, we can try and be as articulate as possible in our praying, but we still will always pray far short of God's revelation for us. We don't understand Christ nowhere near. I, I, we, we, we're scraping a 1%, if that. We don't understand his purposes for our lives very often we underestimate the way God wants to use us. But the beautiful thing is, as our Heavenly Father, when we come to Him in our infantile, immature, lack of wisdom, lack of perspective language. So what I love is that He just looks at my heart. And He goes, like, I know what you're saying. You can't articulate it, but I know what you're saying. I mean, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? And, and, and so many times um, in prayer, it's, it's so much more about your heart than, than the accuracy of your prayer. 
I mean, it's just very often like the prophetic. You know, you go up to someone and you're seeing something in your mind and you're communicating to them kind of what you see to the best of your ability without, you know, sermonizing and doing all that like, well, like I taught. And you give them the word and they come after us and go like, oh my goodness, that word changed my life. And I love to answer, ask them and say, what did you get out of it? And they tell me, and it's not like what I saw. It blessed them, but it had a complete different, um, when it was conveyed because the significance is for them, and it was like, oh my word, that's even bigger than what I was seeing in my little brain. Sometimes we're praying things, and God's going like, I just, I'm so glad you prayed that prayer. Now I can answer. And then when he answers, it's much bigger than what I imagined. And that's why Paul says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think, and then he, you think that's bad. Then he goes like, or even imagine. I can do that. And, and, it's, and it's really powerful. I, I think those, just uh, those few things, I think we could stop now and just pray. But just those few things will help us to understand the importance of prayer. Now, we're gonna just, I just want to give you a little bit of uh, practical stuff for corporate um, and even for private prayer is this. Always deal with your heart when you go into pray, prayer. Um, when I say always, I, l- let me just rephrase it. Deal with your heart. Um, and there's times when God will help you to deal with your heart when you're going to prayer. The biggest thing is um, that very often prayer becomes ritual or duty. And that's okay. It's okay. It's better to be praying than not to be praying. Because God can change your heart in, in the interim. Is that okay? It's like with everything. It's like with worship. You start in the flesh and you end up in the spirit. You just got to do it. You know, you're tired, you whatever, and then you start to worship and suddenly you feel the wind beneath your wings and you hit that flow. It's the same with praying. And when you get into pray, sometimes this is like, hey, this is hard work, you know. I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues and the guy says to me, practice praying half an hour in tongues every day. So yeah, I was so excited. The next day I went, I prayed in tongues and prayed in tongues and prayed and prayed. I prayed here just, and I prayed in tongues until I was exhausted and I looked up at the clock and I prayed a whole minute. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm a word. Only a minute. <laughs> and, and, and so you start off, and it can, it's, it's, it's work. Come on, church, it's work. It's labor. That's why Paul says, persevere. And, and you labor, in it, but there are times when the Spirit will just come in and, and energize and equip. And when you look at your watch again, it's like three hours. What happened to three hours? Because you're caught up and you're carried along. By the Holy Spirit. Listen, he's more keen for you to pray than what you are. So if we can get in. So just a few practical tips is, um, you know, and, 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 and not to become spiritual navel gazers, you know, always introspecting and things like this. But it's very good just to make sure that your motive for prayer is love for God and love for others. Secondly, and especially in corporate prayer, um, remember that it's an arena of confidentiality. I mean, there's sometimes people give their names in for prayer and you can pray, but you need to pray to the level of confidentiality that you give. And particularly in your private prayers, if someone comes and shares details with you and asks you as an individual, please will you pray for me? They've, what they've shared with you is a confidence it's not to be shared with others. So you don't recruit your favorite prayer partner and say, it's too much for me, but please pray this with me. If it's too much for, for you, then just pack up praying because you've been asked with a confidence, don't bring somebody else in with a confidence because you've just broken the power of that prayer because you've betrayed a trust and you've been dishonest. You all good? So it's important for us um, to, to, to check our hearts, to check our motives, to watch confidentiality. It actually used to be a joke, <clears throat> you know. So I often say this, you can telephone, you can television, um, or you can tell a Christian. <laughs> Either way, it's going to get out. <laughs> the tell a Christian was the worst. And so the prayer meetings, the Tuesday night prayer meetings or the the sisters, 
you know, Chabetzi. That was the gossip session, and they would gossip by prayer request. You know, like sit down, and it's like, oh, I'm so burdened for sister so-and-so. You know, husbands and alcoholic and all this. Well, you've just now, you know, it's like, oh, that's terrible. Okay, everybody, let's pray. <laughs> that's also witchcraft. Amen. And, and so the, the confidentiality and, and things like this. And so I often I've got, um, I've got um, uh, um, people in my church, outside of my church, that, I, will, that I, I know I can trust. And there are certain confidentialities that I will share with them. And, uh, and, and they're like around the country, around the world. But then there's, I've got two or three ladies in the church that I can share confidentiality with and, and I'll know. Some of my, my, my elders are like that. If I ask them to pray for me for personal things, they will pray and it won't get out. And, and, and we need that kind of thing, amen? Can I have an amen? Yeah. All right. So, so those are some of the things, the practical, t- practical tips when it comes to praying. Um, so number one, deal with your heart. Second thing, deal with distractions. Now, this is corporate or private, but let me just talk about your personal prayer life. And, and uh, number one, deal with inner distractions. It's very important that we pray together in unity, unity of heart and mind. You know, otherwise it's a little bit like vain babblings. Because, you know, you, you're praying, but your, your mind is on something else. You're completely divided in your attention. Now look, it is very difficult to, to bring your mind in onto focus. But that's why it's important to lock into Scripture, um, to, to meditate on what you're um, doing, etc., 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 so that there's a unity of heart and mind in our praying. Is that okay? So deal with your inner distractions. One of the things that I, I used to do when I was praying the, the eight hours of prayer a day is that um, I would be praying, and I, I don't know if it was my undisciplined fleshly mind or it was the devil, both very much alike, they're related, is, is that I would remember everything that I had to do. And, and I was like, I'm, I'm start praying, Shabara, Bunti, Graha, Father, this, and it's like suddenly I remember, oh, I need to phone that person. So now I'm carrying this thought. And then, and then it's like, oh my goodness, I've got to fix the gutter. And then it's like, now I'm carrying two thoughts. And it's not long, I'm carrying 20 things in my mind. And I think, oh God, I've got to do these things, I've got to do these things. And I, I'm completely distracted. My, my prayer focus is fractured in 20 ways. And so one day I was going like, Jesus, how can I do this? He said, thank the Lord for reminding you. That's what the Lord said. Thank the Lord for reminding you, but take a notepad with you. So I put, it, I put it on the pulpit when I walk around the church and pray. And when I remember something, I write it down. Okay, it's excluded. And sometimes I'll even say, thank you, devil. Because now I've dealt with it, amen? So deal with distractions. If you're going to set aside time to pray, make, deal with every eventuality that you can think of that may come up so that you can create that space of time. Okay, practical. Um, the next thing is um, a condemning heart, a guilty conscience. Deal with that at the outset. Isn't it amazing? I don't know if you've ever discovered the devil loves worship. Because I often find the worship is just awesome. And you just go, oh, Jesus. And there he is going like, oh, yeah. And what sign did you show that taxi driver this week? And what about your wife? How irritated did you get with her? And it's just like, really? In worship? How can you do this now? Okay, some of you are looking at me like, Pastor John. <clears throat> okay, so I'm the only one that's experienced that. It's fine. It's okay. Forgive me. All right. But deal with it immediately and learn how to receive his immediate forgiveness. Isn't it? It's really, really interesting how, um, you know, Paul talks about it when he says, you know, when you come to offer your gift at the altar, and they remember someone has ought against you. Leave the gift, go and sort it out, come back and then offer the gift. Because he's talking about that condemnation. Um, you cannot with a clear conscience give it. We know uh, John says in First John, is it First John 4, First John 5, First John 4, he says God is greater than our hearts and he can put our hearts at rest in his presence. Isn't it amazing that in, it's in his presence 
our hearts condemn us. And so it's important to deal with those outer distractions, um, you know, take care of a lot of things, write down everything you need, etc., etc. And then, um, all right. So now when it comes to corporate prayer, some things that I've learned over the years, and I, I'm saying this just to put it onto the landscape, if you lead prayer uh, in a home cell or wherever, um, the more friendly and the more loving your church is, the more rules you need. <laughs> so our Saturday morning prayer meetings, I started them uh, in 1985, and they're still going, um, Saturday mornings. And it's, um, we have a, a really good attendance at our Saturday morning prayer meetings, and it's awesome. But, you know, our church is very loving. Everybody's huggy, lovey, kissy, whatever. And uh, people don't all arrive at the same time. So they arrive, you know, in dribs and drabs or dribs and drabs. So I had to take control of it because it's like, so normally I start of outlining, you know, the prayer requests and what we're going to pray on. I've got them written on the board, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I'm explaining what we're going to pray, how we're going to pray, why we're going to pray. There's some scriptures, there's this, there's this, et cetera, et cetera. And then somebody walks in and they're five minutes late. Then they've got to go around and hug and kiss everybody. So I've kind of got to like pause, you know. And then I start again, then somebody else comes in. And then everybody's got to be hugged and kissed. And then we start praying. You know, and then somebody else has come in. Like, they're like 15, 20 minutes late. And everybody's got to get a hug and a kiss and a greet. So eventually I had to stop and just go like, okay, whoa, 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 ground rules. Number one, if you walk in late, you're late. So greet everyone afterwards. So everybody else, you ignore them until the end because it's this stop, start, stop, start. And again, it's fractured prayer. Because um, Matthew 18, is it Matthew 18? With a place of agreement is the place of power. Whatever two or three agree on earth, that'll be done in heaven. There's, there is, a, there is a, a power in agreement. And, and if things are constantly being broken as far as our flowing together and praying, um, um, everybody praying together, praying in agreement, praying for the same subject, and then you've got to stop, start. So number one, you know, greet the beginning, then leave it. Number two, number two, I, I forbid them from doing this. Because it's like we have a very prophetic church. So we'll start praying. And then when I look again, everybody's prophesying to each other. Everybody's giving each other word. Everybody's joined hands and they're praying for one another. So I've got to say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, a, this is not a prophecy meeting. This is a prayer meeting. It's bit, a little bit of the undiscipline of the spirit-filled churches. Okay, say amen. Just make me feel better. Just say amen, amen. Just make me feel better. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and so I tell people, if you have a word for someone, give it afterwards. Let the ministry happen afterwards. Okay, because this is a prayer meeting. It's different like if you're having a home cell and you open it up and you say, have you got a word for each other? And things. We've got we to gotta set the parameters. We've got to determine the purpose of this meeting is a prayer meeting, okay? Even if what we are praying, this particular moment, what we're praying, you felt for this person, still finish the prayer, finish the prayer meeting, and then go and minister. So it's, it's fantastic now uh, that people do that. When they, when they walk in, they just do a little, and they quickly sit down, you know, now. And it's like, okay, this is good. Now we're on track. And um, then I see people afterwards all ministering to each other and praying for one another which i give time to it, it's not it's you know in its place then it's appropriate are you all good and so some of these are, are the things that we've got to watch because remember the enemy hates prayer he will do anything i think it was ian bound said this the reason the devil uh, resists you so much when you're going to the prayer closet is because he knows you go there to fetch power against him and so very often it's those little things that we think are insignificant, but they are significant, okay? And, and so the work of prayer, the job of prayer is really, really important. So we need to um, follow the ground rules. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure what time we stop the session. Goodness me, look at the time. There's no way I'm going to get through this, but we'll have to rush. All right, so what we're going to do is this. Um, <clears throat> I want you to take probably about five minutes, so just for the sake of time, I want you to pray. So 
I want you to find some space in a moment, once, once I've outlined it. I want you to find some space. You can sit, stand, walk, lie down, kneel. You can just whatever posture you're more comfortable with in prayer. But the, the, the topic of this um, conference is Lord, teach us to pray. And it very much comes from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11, verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Prayer was the habit of Jesus. If Jesus, as the pure, sinless Son of God, needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? It's interesting that Luke records it, and you'll see why it's interesting as we go further. Um, he said, just as John taught his disciples to pray. So your pastor, pastors are really on key because <clears throat> John taught his disciples to pray. And the disciples saw something, made some connection between the miraculous ministry of Jesus and his prayer life. And they were right. And that's why they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, pray after this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here we have, and, and you, probably, you will probably know this, an incredible structure of prayer, for prayer. And, and, and often we will pray that in our prayer meetings. We'll start with our Father, just that bit, or our Father who art in heaven. And we'll just glory in the fact that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the God and Father of John. And, and then, you know, we flesh it out from there, and you can put all your prayer topics under every one of those things. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why does the church need to be a praying church? Because of that verse, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not going to arrive on its own. It will arrive whether you pray it or not because there's others praying. But I'd rather be included in the prayer. Revival is going to come whether you seek it or not. But I would rather be included in the revival. It would break my heart if it breaks out in another church before it breaks out in my church. <laughs> there's just a little bit of godly jealousy, and there's a whole lot of mine. <laughs> but, but I don't want God to bypass me. I don't want to God to bypass us. And, and so we need to see his kingdom come, and for the vision of this church, the vision that has been placed in your pastor's heart, the only way it's going to come is through prayer. Amen? So what we're going to do is um, we're going to, I'm just going to play this instrumental music just for about four or five minutes because of the time, and then I think soon we have to stop for a tea break, um, and then we'll see how far we can get in the last little while. But I just want you to take time to pray, and this is what you're going to pray, just in the instrumental, and you're going to pray, Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, please, will you teach me to pray? Now, I'm, 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 I just know this, is that we have different levels of prayer lives, different extents, different expressions of prayer lives, as many as there are individuals here. But I don't know about you, <clears throat> um, there's still so much more to learn about prayer. And whether you're just beginning uh, or you're wanting to just go further with prayer, <clears throat> um, just say, Lord, would you t please teach me to pray? That's the only request that I want you to do for now. Just four or five minutes, then we'll stop the music. Sorry? So just, just as we're ready. Okay, so while they're getting ready, I'll just tell you what, just a little while ago, it was just a matter of weeks ago, please keep praying for me. Thank you for those of you who are. But I'm, I'm, I'm heading to the close of the book, so um, the uh, printers, publishers are already lined up. 
And, and so the book will be finished soon. So thank you for your prayers. And um, um, just to pray for me on that. But the Lord spoke to me a little while ago. I was sitting and reminiscing about how I used to pray. You know, the hours and hours of prayer, the, the days and days of fasting with prayer. Praying in tongues right the way through the night. And the Lord just began to show me the, the results in my life, the results in the ministry, the results in, you know, us planting churches, the results in the itinerant ministry, different countries around the world. And, uh, and I was just going like, wow, Lord, wow, Lord. And just like that, he interrupted and he said, now I want you to get back to that, the way you prayed then. When you finish the book, that's how I want you to pray. And, and so for me, I'm experiencing this definite um, pull. It was an instruction and a command, but at the same time, there's this yearning in my heart uh, to get back to prayer. It's the most productive you can be. You know, it was Martin Luther that brought about the Reformation in the 1500s. You know what used to happen to him? He'd walk into his office and he would see his desk piled up with pages and pages of work that he had to get through. So his comment was always, yo, there is so much work to do, I better make more time to pray. Because he understood that when he was prayer-filled, he was more efficient and more effective. Amen? So have we got it ready? Just about? Can I, can I just give you, throw another tip quickly? I very often try to use um, instrumental music because if I use, for example, that over there. Okay, we can just drop the volume. Just drop the volume just for a second. Because if I, if I play a song with words, I find myself singing with it rather than praying. Because it's harder work to pray than to sing. Because singing is spontaneous. And look, there's times for that if you want to go into worship, then use words. But in and our Saturday morning prayer meetings, 90% of the time, instrumental. Because otherwise I see people walking around, Our Father in heaven. They're having a worship service. No, this is a prayer meeting. So to this music, find a spot. And we're going to pray four or five minutes. And I want you just to get with God and say, Lord, please teach me how to pray. Right, talk to the Lord. Express your heart. Get into a posture, position. I like to walk.
Hallelujah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I want to just um, maybe end this session to let you go and have a cup of tea in a few minutes. And um, you can just then take a, a restroom break and grab a cuppa, and then we'll get back in. And um, if I can ask us to be precise with the time so that we can get as much of this material done as possible. Awesome. Um, remember that it's his desire um, in the understanding of God. He understands all the, the implications and the necessity and whatever for prayer. And so I want you to, from this moment, um, I want you to be more aware of the promptings, yearnings, drawings, suggestions of the Holy Spirit on prayer. Is that okay? Because he, th this is one of the prayers that he does take seriously. <laughs> he takes them all seriously. But, but it's one of the prayers that God really responds to. All right, um, just quickly again on the practical. And, and I want to touch some things as soon as we've had our tea and coffee break. Hopefully that will just free you from a lot of the nonsense that's going out there, and especially on social media. Um, concerning prayer, you know, and, and there's so many people that just bring so much confusion and they make prayer so complicated, and, and hopefully I can just simplify it a little bit for us now. But praying in tongues for me is a, an important feature of prayer, and um, so every, every service we try to start off with praying in tongues before our opening prayer, every Saturday prayer meeting, everyone knows um, all the lists are there and everything. But the first thing that I do is at least five minutes, sometimes more, sometimes ten minutes. I'll say, I just want you to walk around and pray in tongues. Pray in the Holy Ghost. So um, there, there are various um, interpretations of this. But praying in the Spirit, capital S, doesn't necessarily mean praying in tongues. Praying in the Spirit is when you're praying um, in line with the Spirit. It's like worshiping in spirit and in truth. Praying in the Spirit is praying uh, what he, His will is. And there are, there are times when you, you can be praying in your own mother tongue, you know, and you're praying just exactly as influenced by the Holy Spirit. That's praying in the Spirit. But praying with the Spirit... This little is praying with the Spirit. But praying in the Spirit can also be praying with the Spirit. Tongues. And the, the awesomeness about tongues, and without going into a teaching on it, is that um, no one knows the mind of a man except the Spirit that is within him. So his Spirit in my Spirit knows his mind like my Spirit knows my mind. So when I begin to pray in the Spirit, I'm praying his mind. If that makes sense. Okay? And... Um, the, the Apostle Paul says, if I, pray in, if I pray in the tongues or pray with the tongues of men and of angels, um, there is dimensions of praying with the Spirit or praying in tongues that we have not yet explored. We have not yet discovered. Because Paul says, if I pray in the tongues of men and of angels. In other words, there are extinct languages, they are current languages, and there are languages still to come which the Spirit knows. So your prayer languages or your prayer language becomes limitless. And not only are there those languages, but he says there's the languages of angels. So you've got no limit to the, the language that can become applicable to a prayer request that is more expressive than your own natural language. So the, the other thing, I'll, I'll come back to the number, the other thing about praying in tongues, it's a very quick way to become attuned to the Holy Spirit. A very quick way to get into the Spirit. Because you're enlarging or engaging your spirit and um, you're stepping out of your conscious mind, um, your rational mind, and you're stepping into the Spirit. It's an, always an act of faith because you don't know what you're saying even. So it's a very quick way to get into the Spirit and to pray. 
But of course, it's not just an exercise because as you're starting to pray, you're attuning to the mind of God. So praying in tongues is, is, is just hugely important. It's amazing. Um, and, and it's a way of just becoming attuned and becoming sensitive because, you know, if we pray in, in, in tongues for five, ten minutes, the Lord can hijack my prayer agenda. And what I've got first, he can just say, leave that, put it last. And this is what I want you to pray. So it's, it's just becoming, have I said enough on that? Great. Also, the other thing is I have discovered that in praying uh, in tongues that there have been times when I've distinct, distinct, noticeable language change with every prayer request. You know that um, there are certain languages, like your Latin American languages, which are very excitable, very um, staccato, very, you know, and... Um, um, and then there's the, you know, some of the other different languages that are, are, are just more laid back and, and things like that. And sometimes the, the, the sense of urgency that is attached to the prayer request determines the change in my tongue. And, and I, I'm, it's noticeably different. One time I was just, I didn't have that much time. And I went in to pray, but they were all... Um, urgent prayer requests, and five times my language changed discernibly. Five times, different language, different language, different language. And I was like, my goodness, what is this? And, but it was, you know, the spirit within me responding and just providing me another language, another style. And, you know, with every language set, there's a, almost a different emotion. And one is more urgent than, than the other. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, it's okay. Put it, put it there. File it there. It's on the landscape the next time it happens. Is that okay? And so what, what I want us to do as we close this session, I want us to begin to um, uh, uh, just for a few minutes pray in tongues. One of the things about uniting and unifying your heart and mind um, you know, of course, there's other benefits. You know, when we pray in the Holy Ghost, we build ourselves up in our most holy faith, you know, etc., etc., etc. But the, the incredible thing is that um, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So if I have a prayer request, a prayer item on my mind, and I start to pray it in English, and I switch over to tongues, the Holy Spirit will not hijack and, take, and go and pray for something else because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. The, the Holy Spirit in my spirit will follow what I've been praying with my intellect. Does that make sense? Okay. So very often I will, to keep my mind engaged so I'm not, my mind not wandering, I will mention what I'm going to pray. So I will mention it and then I'll start to pray in tongues and then in my mind, I'm, 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 I'm keeping my mind fruitful by imagining, seeing whatever it is that, that, that I want to pray for. So what we're going to do now, and it's just a couple of minutes, so forgive the few minutes. Uh, it'll be not 1B, it'll be number 2. Um, it's, does it say something about Hagen on number 2? Kenneth Hagen. It's actually Daddy Hagen. So, all right. So this is what we're going to do. What I want you to do is, again, find a spot, but listen to what Daddy Hagen says. And he starts to mention something. So um, um, I would have loved to have had much, much more time so that we could pray into these things more. But here's what we're going to do. Um, in this session, you're going to start to pray in the Holy Ghost. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to keep in mind, and I'm aware that um, uh, um, we have other pastors here as well, other ministries um, but, but for those of you who come here, I want you to be praying for your leaders. Okay, I want you to pray for their vision. Part of the vision is revival. I want you to be praying for revival. And then the other thing that I want you to be praying for is the manifestation of power, um, the gifts of healing and those kinds of things that accompany revival. It actually accompanies us just being men and women of God, sons and daughters of God. And I want you, just for a few minutes, we're going to pray that. Now, he talks for about four minutes, then he's going to start praying in the Holy Ghost. So I want you then, in that time while he's talking, to start listing um, your prayer requests and start speaking them. Lord, we're going to pray. 
uh, for, for Pastor Harriet and Lynette. Pray for the vision um, of Christ's life and revival ministries. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray this. And then when we come to tongues, then you can switch into tongues on those. Is that good? All right, ready. Let's just go on that one. Thank you. Those watching via live stream, you can do the same. And then again, get comfortable. Get somewhere, stand, walk, sit, kneel. And then I want you just to listen to him, follow his instructions. I've added a couple of prayer requests, and then we can go for it. Come and kneel. Everybody can't get down here. I know that there's not enough room. We can push up. But the kneel body. there by your chair. If you have difficulty kneeling, just sit down and bow over on the back of the seat in front of you. We're going to pray the same direction to begin with in English. Hallelujah. And then trust the Holy Ghost to give us utterance. We're going to pray. Praise God that the gifts of special faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings, shall be in manifestation in a greater measure than what we have seen heretofore. That the Father, that the God, that believers, that ministers, that servants of God everywhere will be able to speak His Word with boldness by stretching forth His hand to heal, that signs and wonders will be wrought in the name of our Holy Child Jesus. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we reverence you, we honor you. We thank you because thou art, thou art my very own Father. Thou art, ha, 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 my very own Father. I've been born again. I am a child of God. I am thy son. Praise God. Thank you, Father, for your precious, holy, written word. Thank you, Father, for the example for the illustration of prayer given to us in the New Testament for our guidance, for our edification, for our direction. And we see that the early church prayed that thy servants shall be enabled to speak thy word with boldness by stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders will be wrought. In the name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray the same that thy servants everywhere shall be enabled to speak thy word with boldness by stretching forth your hand to heal, that gifts of healings will be in manifestation. Hallelujah, that signs and wonders will be wrought in the name of thy holy child Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, that special faith, that working of miracles will be in manifestation, that all of these three shall be in manifestation in a greater measure than what we have seen heretofore. All right, that's what's on our minds. Now let the tape roll. So that's, he's fixed us. Have you noticed how he says, let's pray the same direction in English? And now he's going to switch over. He took a brief moment to locate us. We're sons of God. He's our father. All right, so now he's going to switch over. So just play it and we can turn it up. Thanks. And I want you to pray out loud in tongues so that the person next to you can hear. Okay. To give us utterance. That we may pray. Give us anything else that needs to be prayed. Okay, anything this. else that needs to be Shara said in this us. connection. Give us utterance, or in any other area. Praise God forevermore. For the Holy Ghost is our helper. Ha, 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 ha. We are led by the Holy Ghost. We are led by the Spirit. We are led in all avenues of prayer. But we are led in this avenue, in this area of prayer. Praise God. God forevermore, and we appreciate the help of the Holy Ghost. And Paul said, He that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. These things may be a mystery, or as another translation said, divine secret. These things may be a mystery, they may be a secret to me, but they're not to you. Speaking tongues intentionally. And then Paul said, speak in tongues articulately, speak in tongues intelligibly. And one translation said, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me praying, that is the Holy Spirit helping me to pray, but my understanding is untrue. And then he went on to say, what is it then I will? I will. I will, I will, I will pray with the Spirit. That's the tongue. I will pray with the understanding. 
I'm going to pray both ways. So I have prayed with the understanding. Now I will pray. I will pray with the Spirit. With the Spirit. Come on, expand your tongues. Mama Husa Tanto, Mama Husa Tanto, Mama Husa Tanto, Mama Husa Tanto, Mama 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody says, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you can feel we could go on for 30, 40 minutes? And uh, again, I said it while you were praying in tongues. Let me just say it again. You need to pray uh, in tongues intentionally. Uh, don't just suggest it. You know, don't just dabble at praying in tongues. You know, there's very often we like shabby, we're almost apologetic. You know, you pray in tongues in, intentionally or deliberately. You, you pray articulately. Because if you, if you don't articulate the words, you leave no room for him to change the language because you're mumbling. And then you need to pray intelligibly, not intelligibly to yourself, but those words need to be intelligible in the sense that you can hear it and that, that others can hear it. Is that okay? Amen.